Good morning and a very warm welcome to all the respected guests, faculties, staff and the students present here. I, Anushi, take this opportunity to welcome you all for today's public lecture on an economist's journey into the epics by our guest speaker today, Dr. Vivek Debroy. He, he is the chairperson of Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India. The chair for today's session is Dr. Abhay Firodia, industrialist and chairperson of Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute. I now request our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ajit Ranade, to felicitate our guests. organized by Gokhale Institute in collaboration with Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute and Pune International Center. To say a few words about Bhandarkar Oriental uh, Research Institute, it was founded in July 1917 and concerns itself with research activities in the field of Orientology. It has created invaluable reference and archives through the pursuits of its research projects in Mahabharata and Prakritic languages. Talking about Pune International Center, it was started to have an intellectually and stimulating, intellectually stimulating and enlightening conversation and discussion about the future of the city and the world. PIC has over 300 eminent personalities from Pune, and one of which is also our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ajit Ranade. I now request uh, Dr. Rana Day to take forward to take the session forward. Thank you, Anushi, and uh, good morning and namaskar to all of you. Good morning. So this is a great day, great morning. Uh, thank you all for coming here on a Saturday morning. It's a wonderful day for us at Gokhale Institute and uh, it is my pleasant duty to not only be the host but also welcome our uh, chief guest, uh, the, the person who will, go to, will give the public lecture as well as the chairman of the session. I will formally introduce you but uh, I cannot resist uh, but begin by saying uh, uh, Mr. Vivek Devroy is actually here in a manner of speaking and Madam Suparna will, will confirm that he is actually redeeming a promise, a pledge that he I had extracted from him that he should come to our institute and give a talk on this very topic of an economist's journey into the epics. So please give him a warm applause to begin with. <laughs> so I will first introduce our uh, Mr. Vivek Debroy and then I will introduce the session chair. Uh, but a little bit about this topic. Uh, because, you know, uh, this doesn't sound like our usual economics technical topic of future of data analytics or the central bank digital currency or monetary policy or poverty and inequality and so on. It's a journey into the epics and uh, Mr. Dala Rawat is here. I'm sure this is a topic which will be of great interest to you as well. I'm delighted that actually this, this lecture is being jointly sponsored by three very important institutions in Pune. 
uh, as, as Anushi said, Bandar Pei Institute and the Pune International Center. So, uh, how to introduce Vivek Devroy? Uh, I thought I'll begin by just putting some uh, adjectives, and please pardon my, uh, please indulge uh, my, my imaginative or whatever. Maybe it's a uh, limited imagination. He is. These are the num name. These are the adjectives that come to my mind. Prolific, scholar, fearless, forthright, versatile, renaissance man, and brutally honest. So, uh, okay, let me do a little more formal introduction. <laughs> he is currently, as you know, uh, chairman of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India. I think a post that he has held for about five years so, for, for now. He's also uh, the Chancellor uh, of Deccan College in Pune, as you know, uh, a very recent appointment. In fact, uh, the Vice Chancellor of uh, uh, Deccan College is here. Thank you and welcome. Uh, in fact, let me also <coughs> not forget to welcome. There's so many dignitaries here that I, I really wouldn't have time to name each one of you. But thank you very much for being here on this Saturday morning, and of course, my colleagues uh, from Gokhale Institute. So, Mr. Debro is uh, also an anchor of a fortnightly show called Itihasa on Sunset Television. He was born in Shillong in 1955. He is an alumnus of Presidency College of Kolkata, Delhi School of Economics uh, in Delhi, Trinity College in Cambridge. I think Trinity College is also the place where Siri Deshmukh and uh, perhaps Amartya Sen became a master later on. So he comes from that place. Uh, he then, uh, his, what many of you may not know, he's really his first job after coming back to India, really first job, is at the Gokhale Institute. So a warm clap for that. <laughs> so in a manner of speaking, it's a, it's a homecoming, and we are very happy that you're here, sir. Uh, he was here, I don't know if you know, his very first monograph was actually published by Gokhale Institute in our own journal called Artha Vijnana. And, and, uh, and a monograph, and he told me that he could not locate that copy of the monograph, which thanks to our librarian, Dr. Nanaji, we were able to produce before him. We are not going to give it to him, by the way. We are just showing it to him, and he can give you a photocopy, sir. Uh, he also advised three PhD students uh, while he was at Gokhale Institute from 83 to 87, and one of them is quite a well-known um, uh, economist in her own standing, uh, Dr. Rege, Rupa Rege Nitsure. And, uh, you know, over the course of uh, his career, he has spanned both as a, in his role as an economist, but uh, not really economics in one narrow field. Actually, if you look at the subjects, I was just trying to count the subjects that, have, that he has covered in his sort of role as an economist. Game theory, general equilibrium theory, income and social inequality, poverty studies. He was the chairman of a railway reforms committee. He was also chairman of a law reforms committee. So some people think that he's basically a railway person. <laughs> or some others think that he's actually a lawyer in training, or a train, lawyer by training. Then, of course, Indology, not to forget. Uh, so really, this is kind of, that's why I said Renaissance means very, very broad spectrum uh, across in economics. But, 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 actually, he's even, uh, if, if not, uh, bigger, but even equally big scholarship is, of course, in the field of Indology. And, of course, Deccan College is very fortunate to have him as chancellor. He, he has written, um, I don't know, I may be getting it wrong, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least about 12 books. But, of course, that includes a 10-volume translation. So, Vishnu Purana is the latest book which came out in June. Brahma Purana came out in January. Markandya Purana came out in October 19, 2019. The Bhagavad Gita translation, second time or is it a second edition? Second time. He wrote a Bhagavad Gita translation in 2006, and again, 13 years later, uh, another translation, a three-volume translation of Valmiki's Ramayana, a ten-volume translation of the Mahabharata, and of course, the four Vedas. So you must be wondering, he economist hai, he Indologist hai. <laughs> but that's, that's, the, that's the kind of personality he is. And according to me, one more sort of crowning or equally important qualification is, uh, of course, he's written, apart from this, and books and journal articles, he's got, uh, I counted, uh, more than 300 uh, articles in various newspapers. Some of the titles I must read out are, uh, if you, do you want more medals? Then please increase your JDP. 
This is for the Olympic medals. I don't know if you remember the title, Mr. Vivek. Uh, what we haven't fixed after Bhopal. Why giving land titles is a very tough job. A gentleman, only a first a gentleman, then a communist. No, I, people who know him closely will understand the significance of this title. This was actually an obituary of uh, Jyoti Babu, Jyoti, uh, Jyoti Basu, who was, uh, but this was an obituary whose title was a gentleman and then a communist. So these are the kind of uh, range of writings. Uh, but as I said, one more important thing I'll be, you know, amiss not to mention is that he is a great limericist. You must be reading his limericks every day, almost uh, in the mint newspaper. So I can't resist by uh, before concluding the introduction by saying there was a, once a boy named Vivek Debroy. He came to play at an institute called Gokhale, and then he went uh, into the wide world Ahoy. It's a, you know, it's a little extempore, so please forgive the fifth line. So please again give him a warm applause. Welcome the children. I now have the pleasure and privilege of, of uh, introducing to you the chairman of the special session today, of the public lecture, uh, who is a son, if I can say, and also a grandson of, the, of Pune city, uh, Mr. Abhay Firodia, a very leading, well-known industrialist, uh, who is uh, currently chairman of Force Motors Limited. Uh, he, uh, he comes from a family, uh, a distinguished family, of course, uh, who have been uh, freedom fighters, uh, industrialists, and of course, philanthropists. Uh, there is a very, uh, I, I mean, uh, whole range of activities, you know, just matching like our, our speaker today. He had, he, his grandfather, uh, Mr. Kundan Mal Shopchan Firodia was an MA in LLB and a first speaker of the Bombay State Legislative Assembly. So this is a tradition, you know, if you, if you remember, Mr. Gopal Krishna Gokhale sir was the member of not just the Provincial Council but also the Imperial Council. And your grandfather was a member of the Bombay <laughs> Assembly. Uh, Dr. Dr. Abhay Firodia, as I said, is the chairman of uh, Force Motors. Earlier he was also uh, president of the Society of Indian uh, Automobile Manufacturers, that is CM, uh, twice early in 1990 and again in 2017. He's been president of Indo-German of Chamber of Commerce, president of the Maratha Chamber of Commerce, which is headquartered in Pune, president of the Automotive Component Manufacturers Association of India. Automotive component industry is one of the great success stories of India. We talk about IT revolution and perhaps telecom revolution, though telecom is not doing well currently. And the big, other big revolution of India in the last 30 years has been automotive components. Automotive components, uh, uh, actually production in India is four times that of our domestic needs. So they're a major exporter. Last year's exports were $20 billion. And he represents that association. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kavadhyay. The other activity which I'd like to mention is, you know, as you know, Force Motors, by the way, uh, is the pioneer in three-wheeler auto rickshaws, matadors, and other iconic vehicles. It employs more than 10,000 people. But I'd like to mention his other side, which is on philanthropy. He's the chairman of the Gandhi Memorial Society. <coughs> He's chairman of the Regulating Council of the Bandhagar Oriental Research Institute, and we are very happy that uh, Chief Executive over here is, uh, is here, Mr. Kupal Patwadhan. Uh, Dr. Firodia is also president of Virayatan, a, trans a transnational social organization. He's the president of the Ahmednagar Education Society. And of course, he's chairman of the uh, Sri Firodia Trust and the uh, Multan Chand Bora Trust. He's chairman of Amar Prerana Trust uh, and uh, International School for Jain Studies. Which has, which has these organizations, and the Firodia Institute of Philosophy, Culture, and History. Uh, Dr. Firodia is the recipient of the Jain Ratna Award, uh, which he received from uh, Honorable Chief uh, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee. He is also the recipient of the Cross of the Order of Merit from the Federal Republic of Germany. And he, re he received the Honorary Degree or Doctor of Science from the Rajiv Gandhi Technological University, and a Doctor of Literature from the Tulak Ma Ma Maharashtra Vidya Pit and also a doctor of literature from the D.Y. Patil University. And he was named, of course, uh, the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2016. So as you can see, uh, really, of, I mean, of, uh, great, as I said, son and the grandson of Pune, and we are very delighted and privileged to have you here. Please give a warm welcome. <laughs> and so uh, I mean, I could go on and on if you, you know, as you know, professors, when they get a mic, they become mica source. 
So, uh, but I'm going to now uh, hand it over to the chairman of today's session. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, we will have the talk by the public lecture, followed by remarks and observations, and a short talk by our session chairman, and uh, some time to, for Q&A, &Q and then we'll wrap up. So over to you, uh, Dr. Abhay Virudhya. Vivek Devroy on this most interesting subject. And I do not want to stand between you and him. Uh, Dr. Ranade has introduced uh, Mr. Vivek Devroy in such a wonderful manner. And uh, like all of you, I too look forward to hear from him. Dr. Vivek Devroy, please. Thank you, Dr. Rajit Ranade, for that very, very kind introduction. And thanks to the three institutions which have come together to invite me here. All three institutions are institutions that are very close to my heart. Gokhale Institute, Bandarkar, and Pune International Center. I've known Ajit for years and years, but in my recollection, this is the first time that Ajit has presented me with a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> Ajit had actually intended to invite me for this talk while he was in Fiki. For one reason and or another, that did not materialize. And it is only fitting that this invitation should finally materialize in Pune. Pardon me if I get the grammar a little bit wrong. Ithun Maja Pravas Surujala. Khub Lambaja Pravas Jala. I could talk about the content of the Itihasa and Purana texts I have been translating. But instead, Ajit asked me to do something completely different. Ajit asked me to deliver a stream of consciousness kind of talk about how an economist got dragged into this. So that is what I will do. And I will describe to you a series of accidents, destiny if you wish to call it that, which have taken me down this path. As Ajit said, I am an economist, and economists talk about the micro and the macro. So there's a micro bit, a small bit in the translations. I will describe that first. And then I will talk about the macro bit, the larger bit of the translations. The micro bit, by the way, I have mentioned when Bandarkar kindly invited me to deliver a talk some years ago. But it is worthy of repetition. So first, the micro. And as you will see, as I describe them, it was a series of accidents that led me along this path. Coincidences, destiny. I came back from abroad. 
Initially, I was employed in Presidency College, Kolkata, on a contractual job. Sajit is right, my first permanent job was here. At that time, the profess there was a professor of economics in the University of Vishwabharati in Shantiniketan. The economist will recognize his name, originally a statistician. He was known as an economist, Professor Ashok Rudra. Ashok Rudra was Marxist in his proclivities. And occasionally from Kolkata, I would travel to Shantiniketan to meet Ashok Rudra. Ashok Rudra was fairly senior to me, obviously, and he was very contemptuous of my views on economics, and he showed it. I was also contemptuous of his views on economics, although I dared not show it. <laughs> so by mutual tacit con consent, we began to talk about other things. And at that time, Bengal, West Bengal, like Maharashtra, used to have several popular journals in Bengali oblique Marathi. There are academic journals, but pretty close to that. At that time, Ashok Rudra used to write a series of articles in Bengali on what he called Brahmanya Tantra. And we used to discuss that. One great thing about Ashok Rudra, he is, he encouraged every intellectual pursuit. The encouragement tended to be a little greater if the recipient was of the feminine gender, but it was regardless. So one day I went to meet Ashok Rudra and I said, look, the Mahabharata says that the five Pandavas became proficient in the use of five different kinds of weapons. Arjuna in all weapons, Bhima in the use of the Gada, Yudhishthira, contrary to our impressions of Yudhishthira, in the use of the bow and arrow, so on and so forth. So what happens if one does a statistical test to see if there is a significant difference in their usage of different weapons in the Kurukshetra war? When I say this, I'm talking about ordinary weapons. Obviously, I'm not talking about the Divyastras. They belong to a completely different category. <clears throat> Ashok Rudra had a set of volumes of the Mahabharata <coughs> with the Sanskrit written in the Bengali script and a Bengali translation. This was called the Arya Shastra edition. He said, take it, do it. If you are familiar with the Mahabharata, you will probably know that the most ferocious fighting in the Mahabharata took place in the course of Drona Parva, when Drona was the general. So I decided to do this on the basis of the Drona Parva, sat down painstakingly, those days there was no computer, tally marks, count, count, see what happens. So as, not, so as not to maintain the suspense, there was no statistical difference. <laughs> the hypothesis was rejected. Anyway, I had this paper. I got it published in a Bengali magazine. Roughly at the same time, I was suddenly confronted with two shlokas from two great poets, neither of whom are we able to date with certainty. Dadi Kavi, Valmiki, and Kalidasa. Both great poets separated by perhaps five centuries, great poets in terms of descriptions of nature. In Valmiki Ramayana, in Sundar Khan, Rama already knows that Sita has been imprisoned in Lanka. And he's waiting. He's waiting because it is the time of the monsoons. 
and he has to wait until the rains are over for, to invade. And Valmiki describes it in this way. Vidyut pataka savalaka mala shailendra kota kriti sannikasha garjanti megha sabudin nada matta gajendra eva sannyugastra. I don't need to translate all of it. The relevant part is the clouds tinged with flags of lightning, garlanded with cranes. And what are they being compared to? They are com being compared to mad, intoxicated elephants that are fighting. Matta Gajendra Eva Sangyudast. Kalidasa Megadutam. As everyone present here knows, in Megadutam there is no particular story. The Yaksha has been derelict in his performance of duties and he is being banished by his lord and master to Ramgiri for one year. He is pining for his beloved. He sees a cloud and sends the cloud as a messenger. So in the first part the cloud goes as a messenger and the second part the cloud returns. And right towards the beginning of Megadutam, Asha Rasya Prathama Divase Mega Vashlista Sanum Vapra Krira Parinada Gaja Prekshaniam Tadashya. Don't need to translate all of it. In this particular case, also the clouds are being compared to elephants. And what are the elephants doing? Vapra Krira, which is what the elephants do when they use their tusks to playfully dig up the ground near rivers. And it's struck. Two poets, both of them compare clouds to elephants. Here is Rama who is dying to fight and what are the elephants doing? They are fighting. And here is the Yaksha who is fighting for his beloved and what are the elephants doing? They are playing. And it was almost as if a curtain was lifted in front of my eyes and I thought, if I do not read this literature, I'm missing out on something in life. So A, the Shokrudra trigger, B, the discovery of these shlokas, I became interested. While I was still in Kolkata, I wrote about three other essays on various aspects. Astras, Divyastras, the nature of the Lanka war, the nature of the Kurukshetra war, and then I moved to <coughs> in Pune in those days, on one side of a, the road, if you ask for the famous Dandekar, they would mention VM Dandekar. <laughs> on the other side of the road, if you ask for the famous Dandekar, they would mention RN Dandekar. <laughs> so that particular essay, the statistical test one, I translated into English. One day I walked into Bori, Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute. At that time, the director of the, not the director, the editor of uh, Annals of the Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute was Dr. G. B. Palsule, who later went on to become the director. I met Dr. Palsule. I said, I have this paper. I would like it to be published, to be considered for publication in Abori Annals of the Bandarkar Oriental Research Institute. Dr. Palsule looked at me and said, what do you do? I said, I'm an associate professor at the Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics. To his eternal credit, he didn't raise his eyebrows. <laughs> he said, leave it, we will get a referee. The referee's comments came. Effectively, the referee said, he was not nasty in his choice of words, I'm being nasty. Effectively, the referee said, good paper, we should publish it. But doesn't this idiot know that the critical edition of the Mahabharata exists? And what is this Arya Shastra edition? <laughs> that 
is how I discovered the critical edition of the Mahabharata. <laughs> Remember I said counting tally marks, so back to square one, tally marks count, that paper was published in a worry. While I was in Pune, some four or five papers were published in a worry, six I think. Then we moved to Delhi. I became a professor at the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. At that time, if you remember, Ramayana and thereafter Mahabharat was the rage on television. So I thought this is the right time. I've got about six essays on Ramayana and Mahabharata. Let me write a few more. Let me get hold of a publisher and let me publish a book. So in 1989, this was published as some essays on the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. It got reviews, good reviews, didn't sell at all. The publisher went bankrupt, not because of this book. <laughs> it was quite a decent book, but it was it is now out of print, I think. With that book having been published, I began to think, now what? So I thought, now that I've read the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, let me try and read the Puranas. So I began to read the Puranas. At that time, there was a publisher, he's still there, except it's passed on to the next generation, named, DK, named Praveen Mittal, DK Publishers. He used to publish my economics books, one of which is displayed downstairs. So he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading the Puranas. He said, why don't you translate the Puranas for teenagers? reduced each Purana to 100 pages. I said, okay, why not? The Puranas, as I will tell you later, vary enormously in size. So reducing them to 100 pages is a massive act of abridgment. So I did that. As some of you probably know, in listing of the Puranas, there is no uniformity or in the case of two Puranas, actually I translated 19 Mahapuranas, all reduced to 100 pages. I did the 11 major Upanishads and the four Vedas. They were bad translations. Don't read them, <laughs> although they still sell. <coughs> this is micro. I said I will describe in a stream of consciousness kind of way the micro and the macro. This was the micro. In the year 2004, January 2004, I had a heart attack. A heart attack is nothing provided it is identified as a heart attack and you are in hospital. <laughs> within the first one hour, the golden hour. In this particular case, there was a misdiagnosis, so I was not in hospital for 36 hours. So in some sense, I was lucky to be alive. And in retrospect, it completely changed my attitude to life. In retrospect. <coughs> For instance, I decided that I would not publish because I wanted to be part of the rat race. I consciously decided to opt out of the rat race. On 17th of January, on 21st of January 2004, as I was waiting to be operated upon, out through the window I could see the birds chirping. I could see the sun glistening amongst the trees and I took a resolve that if I survive this particular calendar year 2004, 
If I survive, I will publish 12 books and that is it. Enough of economics as part of the rat race. I survived. And published means authored as well as edited. If you want 12, you have to aspire higher. It just so happened that in the year 2004, I actually authored and edited 15 books. Then I opted out of that rat race, so to speak. All right. Soon after that, I meet Praveen Mittal at a book fair. Praveen Mittal says, Devraj Saab, do you know your books? Those translations, bad translations, they're doing very well. Do you know your Rig Vedas are on the Harvard reading list? Your Vedas are on the Harvard reading list. I said, I didn't know that. He said, look, now earlier what you did was an abridged translation. Now I want you to do an unabridged translation of the Rig Veda with the Sanskrit on one side and the English on the other. I was not particularly interested. To ward him off, I said, all right, I will think about it. I was not terribly interested, but I began to read the Rig Veda again. If you read with a view to do an unabridged translation, you read every word. Unlike when you're doing an abridged translation. So I read it. And suddenly in the Rig Veda, I find a reference to dogs being used as beasts of burden. I thought, I hadn't noticed that. <coughs> the Vedas, as you know, are essentially mantras <coughs> to various deities, divinities. In the Yajur Veda, I suddenly find a mantra or a shloka dedicated to a dog. <coughs> I, thought, I hadn't noticed this. And suddenly, I was collecting material on dogs. Wherever, not just the obvious dog, that was not a real dog that followed the Pandavas, that was Dhanuma disguised as a dog. But for example, in the Valmiki Ramayana, when Sita throws down her ornaments, her earrings, the Valmiki Ramayana says, are in the shape of a dog's teeth. When Bharat is in, in his maternal uncle's house and news is conveyed to him about Dasharat having died, he brings back gifts. Those we all know, blankets, horses, also dogs. What kind of dogs? Antahpure Sanbriddha. Dogs that had been bred within the palace. So as collecting material on dogs, the mother of dogs is Sarama. And the dog of the gods is also Sarama, which is why dogs are known as Saramea. So as just collecting material on dogs everywhere. Itihas, Purana, Jatakas, taking pictures, because as some of you may know, the dog is a vahan for Bhairav, or one particular manifestation of Bhairav. As some of you may not know, in Dindori, there is a temple that is exclusively dedicated to a dog. So I have this manuscript called Sarama and her children. It was turned down by exactly 13 publishers. <laughs> 13 publishers refused to publish it. So people think an established author, easy to publish, not necessarily so. I hung around for 45 minutes, hoping to meet a publisher who now chases me. This was many years ago. <laughs> and then I went to Penguin. I said those earlier micro-translations were bad because my Sanskrit was not that good. By now my Sanskrit was beginning to improve. And by the way, I have no formal training in Sanskrit. It's completely self-taught at home. 
I went to Penguin. Penguin said, lovely book. Of course, we will publish it. But we have always wanted a translation of the Bhagavad Gita. So will you please translate the Bhagavad Gita? I said, I've always wanted to translate the Bhagavad Gita. I will happily do it. So it is almost like a quid pro quo. We will do your dog book if you do our god book. <laughs> back, these were published in 2005 and 2006. Sarama and their children and the first translation of Bhagavad Gita that Ajit mentioned. The Mahabharata in some parts is perceived to be unlucky. In North India, I have not confronted it in Maharashtra. I know it does not exist in Bengal. It does not exist in the south of India. In North India, I have been told that no one keeps the Mahabharata at home. I think one particular reason is its original Persian translation, the title that was given to the Persian translation, which effectively means conflict. In addition, there is supposed to be a curse about people who have translated or sought to translate the unabridged Mahabharata in the sense that at least three people who have tried to do that died. I was reading one of these incomplete un incomplete translations and this is the incident about Nala and Damayanti where the text says that Kali had entered Nala's body. And in the translation I find, <coughs> Kali has entered Nala's body. And I thought, what? <laughs> Kali in the Mahabharata? Sometimes when the Westerners translate, I'm not very sure whether they translate on the basis of the Devanagari or on the basis of the IAST. I prefer the Devnagar even because in the IAST it is very easy to ignore or forget the diacritical marks and the dots. At one level, I don't think it is sufficient to criticize the Westerners for their bad translations until we ourselves do our translations. If you look at the translations, you look at something like sacred books of the East. What did it translate? It translated Vedanta and Itihasa. By and large, except for another series which was published out of Allahabad called Sacred Books of the Hindus, Itihasa and Purana has not been translated by the Indologists and the Sanskrit scholars regarded as myth. I don't think that's true at all. I have no reference to Devdant in general. I think dharma functions because of the way Hindus, Indians, Bharatiyas practice dharma. And where is that dharma documented? It's documented in the Itihas and the Purana. <coughs> So I translated the Mahabharata, unabridged translation, as Ajit said, based on the critical edition of the Bhandarkar, which is why I am sometimes abused, because what people really want to abuse is the critical edition, and they end up abusing my translation on grounds of, not commission, grounds of omission much more. Anyway, <coughs> while this translation of 10 volumes was going on, Ten volumes initially published sequentially, now available as a box set, published in 2015. It amounts to about 2.25 million words. While this was going on, because of the curse, <laughs> which my wife knew about, because Wendy Doniger had sent me an email saying, Vivek, please be careful. <laughs> <laughs> my wife was in a considerable state of trepidation. 
So this was published. It is the third, sometimes people ask me, why have you translated the Mahabharata? Surely there are so many translations floating around. They aren't. I'm talking about translations in English. There are only three unabridged translations of the Mahabharata in English. Unabridged, only three in English. The first one was done by Kishori Mohan Ganguly in the 1880s. The second one was done by Manmathanath Dutta in the 1890s. And the third one is mine, which I think conclusively establishes that Bengalis are eccentric and mad. <laughs> After that, I decided to do the Harivamsha. For those who do not know, when we meet Krishna in the Mahabharata, Krishna is already an adult. So a question is asked about his childhood stories, which are there in the Puranas, but they're also there in the Harivamsha. The Harivamsha, strictly speaking, is not a Purana. It is, re it is regarded as an appendix Annexure to the Mahabharata Kila Bhaga, and it was published as part of Bandaka's critical edition also after the original Mahabharata series. So this was published. On 15th of August 2014, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced from Red Fort that Niti Aayog would be formed. And I was informally sounded out whether I would be interested in becoming a member of Niti Aayog. And I said yes. Before becoming a chairman of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, I was a member of Niti Aayog. So I said yes. And then nothing happened for almost six months. Niti Aayog was not formally formed till 1st of January 2015, and the composition was only announced on 7th of January 2015. So my wife and I, we discussed this. All right, so maybe Niti Aayog is not happening. Forget about Niti Aayog. Perfectly happy doing my translations. I will do my translations. And then suddenly on 7th of January 2015, <coughs> it's announced, member of Niti so we had a chat. I said, forget the translations. Destiny does not want me to do the translations. End of the story. Three months later, <coughs> I was on a flight, Jet Airways flight, going somewhere. And there was a gentleman sitting right next to me. I was reading something in Sanskrit. Hitopadesh, if you want to know what I was reading. And I noticed that he was reading something in Sanskrit too. The probability of finding one single person on a flight reading something in Sanskrit is very low. The probability of finding two people sitting next to each other who are reading something in Sanskrit is almost zero. <laughs> so I was puzzled and intrigued, and so was he. So we soon introduced each other. And then I realized that I knew of his name, he knew of my name, although we had never met, and this was Professor Shailendra Mehta, who was at that time professor in IMA, now is the director of Mika in Ahmedabad. So Shailendra said, Vivek, what are you going to do next? I said, nothing. By the way, I hope Bhandarkar has changed, but if someone writes to Bhandarkar, and says, I want to purchase the volumes, not soft copy. Now, soft copy is available, but soft copy often has typos. I want to purchase all the volumes of the critical edition. Once upon a time, Bhandarkar's marketing used to be pretty bad. <laughs> like that, the critical edition of the Valmiki Raman was published by the Baroda Institute before Niti Aayog had happened. I kept sending people to Baroda, I kept writing them letters, I could never get the critical edition. It, it had several volumes also of the Valmiki Ramayana. So Shailendra said, Vivek, what are you going to do? I said, nothing, I have no time, I'm a member of Niti Aayog now, and look, I tried writing to Baroda, they never sent me the volumes. Shailendra said, okay. 
One month passes. I get a phone call from Shailendra. Vivek, are you in office? I said, yes, I am. He said, I'm coming. In walk Shailendra Mehta with a trolley bag. He has gone to all parts of India. Begged, borrowed, stolen these volumes. Gives them to me and says, all yours. Now I'm in a state of shock. And I tell my wife after that, if I do not do a translation of the Valmiki Ramayan, I am toying with destiny. <laughs> so I did the Valmiki Ramayan. Which is why the three volumes of the Valmiki Ramayan are dedicated to Shailendra Mahesh. There's a central university, Sanskrit university in Delhi, known as the Lal Bahadur Shastri Sanskrit <coughs> University. There are Sanskrit colleges and universities in India where you learn Sanskrit in Marathi, where you learn Sanskrit in Bengali, where you learn Sanskrit even in English. That's not how you learn a language. You need to learn Sanskrit in Sanskrit. Lal Bahadur Shastri is one of these universities where everything is in Sanskrit. For that particular convocation, the chief guest was the then minister, Smriti Irani, who had been given a written text in Sanskrit, which she delivered with considerable aplomb because she is very proficient in a large number of languages. The then vice chancellor, a different professor Pandey, Ramesh Pandey, he was looking for someone who would deliver the special guest address in Sanskrit. So he got hold of me, that happened. So I got to know Professor Ramesh Pandey. Ramesh Pandey said, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm not very sure. Maybe Puranas, I don't have time. For the Puranas, work on the critical editions have started. But you still don't have a complete set of critical editions of the 18 Mahapuranas. There are 18 Mahapuranas I mentioned earlier. You don't have a complete critical edition set. All the scholars say that the best edition was something known as the Ninnai Sagar edition, which was published towards the beginning of the 20th century and was republished by a publisher known as Nag Publishers based out of Delhi, which published all of these in the 1950s with funding from the Ministry of Human Resource Development. But these were out of print. So I told the VC of Lal Bahadur Shastri, maybe the Puranas, but I can't get these texts, they're out of print. And when I say texts, do realize that the Puranas vary enormously in size from 8,000 shlokas to 85,000 shlokas in the Skanda Purana. The Skanda Purana is almost as much, as long as the Mahabharata. So when I say Puranas, each Purana may have multiple volumes. So I complained to him, saying that, look, I don't know, can't get these editions. Some weeks after the convocation, I get a phone call from the VC. Can you come to my office? I went to his office. He says, le jaye. <laughs> Eleven Puranas, he had got the texts. I repeat. A Purana may have multiple volumes, so multiple volumes, 11 Puranas. Again, it's almost as if destiny was indicating, better do it. I rung up Nag Publishers and I said, he came to meet me. I said, here I have got 11, these seven I don't have. Can you help? All publishers, as you know, keep copies, one copy. A few weeks later, he comes. He folds, he's photocopied his from his main set and has given me these seven Purans. So I have now all 18. 
Now, if this is not an indication of destiny, what is? I was still trying to decide which Purana to start off with. I wasn't sure. And by the way, selling the so-called Purana project to a publisher is not easy because you have to persuade the publisher that there is a market. After all, all publishers are driven by commercial considerations. Suddenly we get an invitation, we means my wife and I, to go and visit the SCORN headquarters in Mayapur on the day of Rakhi Purnima, which is Chaitanya Dev's birthday. We go there and we are presented with Sri Prabhupada's 17 volume translation and commentary of the Bhagavad Purana. So that's how I first did the Bhagavad Purana. As Pradeep mentioned, after the Bhagavad Purana, I have done the Markandeya Purana. I have done the Brahma Purana and the Vishnu Purana, those have been published. The Shiva Purana, which was one of the most difficult Puranas so far to translate, I have done. It's going to be published it's to the publishers. It is going to be published sometime early next year. I'm about to finish the sixth, which is the Brahmanda Purana. If you look at the Puranas, the Mahabharata amounts to 100,000 shlokas. I mentioned 2.25 million words. The 18 Puranas amount to 400,000 shlokas, so they will amount to 12 million words. If you include the Mahabharata and Ramayana, that's about 15 million words altogether. I am roughly, if I include the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, I am roughly at about 5 million words today. But my intention, my hope, my aspiration is to complete the translations of all 18 Puranas unabridged in English, because particularly there's a younger generation which is no longer familiar with Sanskrit, is much more familiar with English. So it is partly for that generation. And the reason an economist has stepped in is, as I said earlier, the Sanskrit pundits and the Indologists were not doing that. So if they were not doing that, someone else <laughs> has to do it. And I'll illustrate it before you the succession of coincidences which have almost directed me along this path. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vivek Dev Roy, for what has been a very exhilarating lecture on your most unusual, exotic journey in delving into epics while you have been an economist. It's a rare combination. And uh, what you have achieved in both fields is spectacular. I must say, I find myself now to be like the batsman who's come to the crease and finds himself having missed the first ball and nearly got stumped. I came expecting that Dr. Dev Rai will not only talk about his journey through epics, but about the connection between epics and economics. I did not read the title properly. <laughs> so I came thinking, knowing of Dr. Dev Rai's reputation of his great erudition is knowledge of the epics, that he would certainly be enlightening us on the epics, which are in the Sanatan tradition. And I felt that I could say a few words about the epics in the Shraman tradition. 
I do not claim to have the erudition, the scholarship, the knowledge that Dr. Dev Rai has. But I've been thinking and working on a project to enhance the understanding about the Shaman tradition in India. <coughs> Most people do not really appreciate, understand, or have delved into what is the Shaman tradition. This tradition is parallel to the Vedic tradition and is different. The Shaman tradition is said to have been established in the Bronze Age, which is roughly, Dr. Pandey can uh, confirm or uh, negate what I'm saying, roughly about 5,000 years ago. And what was that tradition all about? There are two important points. One is that Rishabhadev, also called Adi Dev, Adinath, has many, many similarities to Shiva. Enunciated a code of conduct for a civilization which was emerging. Mankind was nomadic, mankind was unsettled. They were hunters, gatherers before the Bronze Age. And it is then that settled civilization began. <coughs> and what Rishabhdev has said is redacted into the epics of the Jains and exists today in very, very copious form in many languages from all over India. He said six very important things which relate to the connection between economics and society, economics and mankind's ethics. And I had thought that we will probably be delving a little bit more on economics. So I sort of thought I would present this to you in brief. He said, Asi, Astra, Weapon. The first Jain Tirthankar did not speak of Ahimsa. He spoke of weaponizing yourself. He said, protect yourself with weapons. Masi, Masi is ink, communication. Kasi, and this is all Prakrit. Kasi is Krishna. Produce. Don't just produce, produce surplus. And why do I infer? Because the next one is Vanitya, trade. I do not know of another dharma pravartak, so to say, who spoke of trade as an important element of mankind's existence. And then he went on to speak of Kala and Vidya and so on. So this is, this is the teaching with which the Shraman tradition started. And out of this tradition, parallel to the evolution from Vedic to uh, Upanishadic, Shaman tradition went on evolving till the time of Mahavir. By the time Mahavir came, which is only 2,600 years ago, several thousand years had passed, within the Indian continent, mankind had settled there were cities, kings, temples, stupas, laws. <coughs> Mankind was marrying, building families, bringing ethics to the next generation. And what Mahavir said is different from what Rishabhadev said in so far as he was talking on a background of a society which was settled. And he was talking on the background which we don't recognize today, all traditions in India, whether they were Vedic, whether they were Shaman, had no real major conflict. 
There were differences of opinion. And these differences of opinion were argued and discussed and manifest in society. But there was no animosity, no enmity of any significance at all. And whatever Mahavir taught was on that background of society where he spoke of peace, he spoke internalized, try to improve yourself, try to find uh, moksha. Now, when I was trying to understand this some ten years ago, I was advised by one of the leading Jain sadhvis, Sridhar Acharya Chandana, that we should build a museum or a knowledge center. Because most Jains don't know what Jainism is. And most Sanatan Hindus will know very little about what the epics are, what the teaching is, what the tradition is. So the quest to build this uh, knowledge center started. I'm happy to tell you that last eight years I'm working on it. The building is 300,000 square feet, 3 lakh square feet air condition. The project is on a 50 acre site near Pune. It's a one hour drive from Pune and a two hour drive from Bombay. It covers in half the museum philosophy. What is karma? What is jiva? What is ajiva? <coughs> Nobody explains this to you. So the effort is to explain this, but you can't bore them with a tome and say, here, read thousand pieces. Nobody would do it. So these are eight-minute audio, visual, immersive, artificial reality experiences that explain these basic concepts. Then there is the evolution. How it all started? Who were the people? And it would not be wrong for me to mention that Chandragupta Maurya was a Jain by tradition, by religion, by values. And his, in his time, was Kautilya, also known as Chanakya, and also sometimes referred to as Vishnugupta. So what Chanakya said, and what he preached by way of economics and politics, is something which evolved during the reign of Chandragupta Maurya, who was a Jain emperor. His son was Jain, his grandson, in the Shravan tradition, shifted to being a Buddhist. But this was Shravan value system. And today, even to this day, you see that in India, even though the Buddhist tradition is more or less finished, the Jain tradition survives. Jains are distinguished by the fact that they are entrepreneurial, that they are focused on economics, that they are focused on creating surplus, they are focused on vanitya. So there is, within the Jain or the Shraman tradition, this great connection between economics and you would find it reflected in the Jain epics. There is a tremendous amount of literature on the Shraman and Jain tradition. Not only it is there in the Buddhist tradition in Pali, it is there in the Jain tradition in Prakrit. Prakrit is a combination of many regional languages which evolved naturally Prakritic, therefore Prakrit. I interpret and I always have a quarrel with my colleagues in the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute. When I say Prakrit is primary, it is Prakritic, Sanskrit is Prakrit on which Sanskar has been done. And there is of course a controversy, but I enjoy that controversy. And this Prakrit language has remained not translated properly. The enormous amount of literature that exists has not been brought to the attention of the modern scholars or the modern people. And an effort is on for the last 40 years at the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute. It was started by my father 
in collaboration with Dr. Dandekar to, to create a Prakrit English dictionary so modern scholars who are proficient in English can get uh, access to the Prakrit literature. And in this Prakrit literature, to economic matters, there is enormous attention. So economics is very much a part of the shaman tradition. Trade is very much a part of the shaman tradition. I would not like to take much more time. I would like to invite all of you to visit this uh, experience center, which uh, is the building is nearly complete for the last eight years. We are working on the content and on the art, every piece of art there, and there are 2,000 pieces of art are all original. We have recreated or we have commissioned artists to do it. It costs a lot of money and I decided I will not go and borrow even a farthing from anybody. Whatever it costs, I will invest either by myself or through my trusts or from my companies. So I expect that maybe it costs 300 crore rupees, should be over sometime early next year and we will throw it open to public. We are catering for 2,000 footfalls per day a whole day experience. The restaurant seats 600 people. So uh, I thought that the, the Shaman tradition as manifest in India today, mainly through the Jain tradition, needs to be presented to people. And all are welcome. I'm still keeping a very low profile on this. And we are not advertising what we are doing. But I can tell you it is beautifully referenced. Our uh, content team has been consulting with every major scholar in this area that we can contact. And there is much on not only the philosophy, but the history, the architecture, the great temple tradition, the tradition of scholarship, the aspect of trade. All of that is covered. You will not be able to see it in one day. The total seeing time if you want to see everything is going to be not less than two days. So uh, this I'm trying to do uh, just as Dr. Dev Rai was inspired by an accident to get involved in his study of the epics and then to do what spectacular work he has done. I think I also accidentally came into it. The fundamental difference is he's a scholar and I'm a businessman. I'm not a scholar, but I'm doing this out of charity. I'm not doing this. It's not a business project for me. I don't expect to make a farthing. I would be very happy if the institute is self-sufficient. I will conclude by saying that I'm a little bewildered about this uh, topic today. Uh, I thought we would be talking about economics and epics, but we had a wonderful uh, speech by Dr. Devrai on the epics. All of us are enlightened. Uh, I would like to thank him and thank all of you for your very patient uh, hearing that you have given to me. I must admit I'm not as entertaining as he is, <laughs> but I can tell you I'm as passionate as he is. <laughs> so, I think we must use the opportunity of Dr. Devrai's presence amongst us. All of you, if you have any questions, uh, I do hope Dr. Devrai will be willing to take those.
from the reason you are speaking that most people are familiar with English. <coughs> I, I, I have experience. I have experience that there are often two levels of meaning in Sanskrit texts. Many statements are at two levels. One is the is the basic literal level, and the other is the more subtle level. <coughs> like what uh, uh, Mr. Pirodia just said about Masi being writing uh, ink, but Masi also means communication. So many Sanskrit texts, many Sanskrit statements are at two levels. There are many examples we can give. As a translator, have you ever come to wonder at what level you should be translating, or if there's a conflict and you found a resolution? Yes. Um, I think it will be obvious from the answer. It's a very good question. We couldn't hear it properly. No, no, it'll be, the question will be clear from the answer. But regardless, is a very good question. Uh, it depends a little bit on the text. <coughs> importance of what you're saying depends a little bit on the text. With the exception of the Valmiki Ramayana, everything that I am translating and will translate is composed by Veda Vyasa. Veda Vyasa, although all these texts are technically not in prose, Technically, they are in verse form. Veda Vyasa was very matter of fact. He was not like Valmiki. Very useful contrast between the two poets. Veda Vyasa, so and so did this, so and so did that. Uh, he said this, she said that. If it is something like the Upanishads, I would be very hesitant because what I'm fundamentally doing is translating in a popular style without necessarily diluting the academic content. My intention is not to do completely, completely academic translations which deter the popular reader. All these texts are about dharma. So obviously there are sections where there is a question of alternative interpretations. Which one of these do you choose? And do you give all of these? Now, let me give a completely different example to illustrate what I mean. Towards the beginning of Markandeya Quran, Markandeya Quran is so named because it is recounted in a fashion by the Rishi Markandeya. And it starts with questions being asked to Rishi Markandeya about some unanswered questions of the Mahabharata. That's how it starts. Right towards the beginning, there is a reference to Duryodhana as the Jama tree of Balaram. <coughs> Anyone here? is asked, what is the translation of Jamatri? Almost everyone would say, son-in-law. But there is no recorded instance of Duryodhan having been Balaram's son-in-law. The trouble with the Sanskrit language, and let me mention this for those who are not proficient in Sanskrit, is that the 
root meaning comes from the verb. The root meaning does not come from the noun or the pronoun. And depending on the context, therefore, the word can mean different things. <coughs> so if someone says tree is padapa, it is not just tree, it is something that is drinking water with its feet. If ajagara, if there is a word called ajagara, it is something that is swallowing a goat. So an ajagara is not just a boa constrictor or a python. If Dr. Ajit Ranad in his younger days swallowed up a goat, he would have also been an ajagara. <laughs> Jamatri, one of the other meanings of Jamatri, is someone who is liked or beloved. So sometimes it is not the primary meaning that is intended, it is the secondary meaning that is intended. How do you handle this as a translator? 90% of the time it, there is no issue. But there will be those 10% of cases where you have to decide now am I going to give the five possible meanings, particularly in texts that are about, sections that are about adhyata. Am I going to give the five different meanings or am I going to give only one? The part I have chosen other than the Bhagavad Gita translation, and by the way, there are some other translations I do which I did not mention. For these translations, I say this is the meaning that I have chosen but there are other possible meanings that are possible. But I will not burden it with all five meanings because that would have deterred the audience, the readership. Next question. Yes, please. Doctor, you mentioned about uh, Vedas, but there is a continuing link uh, I hope everyone is able to hear me. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah yes. Uh, do you have any intention of uh, translating the Brahman Granthas and the Aranyakas? And there is some mystery about Aranyakas. Could you please throw some light on Surely that? Surely I should leave some work to be done by others <laughs> like yourself. I told you I am only five million words down the path. There are another ten million words pending. After those 10 million words are over, if they are, there are minor Puranas which I intend to turn towards. The reason, as I said, I focused on the Itihasa Purana corpus is because that's an ignored corpus. So far as the Vedas, Vedangas, Upanishads are concerned, several people are doing it, although it is also true that the Shatapata Brahmana has not yet been completely, completely translated. Perhaps someone from Bandarkar will do it. But my focus is Itihasa Purana, and there is quite a lot to be done there. Yes, please. So that was an extremely delightful and enlightening. Yeah, that was an extremely delightful and enlightening lecture. Uh, you came uh, to the epics because it was your natural inclination. But but while while speaking, you also said that you opted out of the rat race. So being in economics, uh, did you think or do you think it's being in the rat race? You opted out because it was. It was, you think it's, an, it's a rat race? I'm not sure I understood the question because I wouldn't hear, couldn't hear completely. Let me explain what I meant by the rat race. In our profession or in every profession, you try to build up your CV <laughs> and you build up your CV through publications. <laughs> when I meant by opting out of the rat race, I no longer write to build up my CV. I write 
because I like writing that. If I write on economics now, I write not to build my CV, but because I like writing what I'm writing. In that sense, opting out of the rat race. It is not given what was said about my affiliation, official affiliation. It cannot be the case that I've taken sannyas, <laughs> come to Bhandarkar, and I'm only doing this. But I write what I choose to write. Yes, several. Yeah, and yes, young yes, man, yes. Light blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, since you're an economist, shout. Speak very loudly. <laughs> Sir, since you're an economist. You Hold the mic a bit closer. Since you're an economist, you have read economics and you have also read into epics. So, when you were translating these epics, so have you analyzed them from a point of view of an economist? And are there any learnings that we can use in modern economic literature apart from political All right. Again, a good question. Let me, let me give an example to illustrate why I think we should bring a multidisciplinary lens to bear on Itihas and Purana. I will give you two, three examples. You should never imprison a relatively rich person who is guilty of a crime because that imprisonment is at the cost of the public exchequer. <coughs> you should instead impose a monetary penalty on him. A relatively poor person should be imprisoned, guilty of a crime. You may or may not agree with that statement, there's a value judgment, but there is an impeccable logic of its own. If I asked you as a student of economics, who do you say think said this? You'd probably say, ah, was it the World Bank? Was it the law and economics people in the University of Chicago? No, the answer is no. This was said by Bhishma to Yudhishthira, in Shanti Parva, when he was lying down on the bed of arrows and instructing Yudhishthira and his brothers. Example number two from the Markandeya Purana. In the Markandeya Purana, there is a reference to a demoness, and this demoness's task is to steal newborn babies. <coughs> she's wicked, she's a demoness. So in whichever household a baby has been born, an infant has been born, she steals that infant, goes to another house where another infant has been born, replaces that infant with this infant, <laughs> takes that infant, goes to another house and generally causes confusion. And of course, there are conflicts of dharma in that section of the Markandeya Puran that I was born as a Brahmana, but thanks to this demoness, I have now grown up in a Kshatriya household. So what is my dharma? You know that. It also tells us that this demoness devours every third infant. What is this telling us? If you are an economist or someone interested in sociology or the social sciences, the moment you read this, you will say, wait a minute, this means that the infant mortality rate whenever this was composed was one third. <laughs> Let me take a third example. We all know about Vishnu's Matsya Avatar and we know about the story of the fish. What kind of a fish was this? What was the fish? It is impossible today to establish authentically when these Puranas were composed. In all probability, 
There was some original source and then it was embellished in different parts of the country. The point being that quite clearly some of these Puranas were composed in some parts of the country and not in others. Because they reflect geographical knowledge about certain parts. Question I posed is, what was the fish? If you look at the Puranas which were composed along the coast, <coughs> This fish is a fish called a safari. A safari is a silvery white fish you find in the sea. If you look at the Puranas which were composed in the eastern parts of the country, this fish was a rohit fish, the roh. In other words, these texts are encyclopedias of knowledge. Clearly, therefore, we need to bring a multidisciplinary lens to bear on these. Governance in our text is not only about Kautilya. Whole lot of texts. My attempt at the moment is simply to translate in English for those who do not know Sanskrit. I do not have the time, even if I have the inclination, to do the kind of research that you have in mind. Although I am committed to writing a book for Penguin on governance in these texts. I have not yet delivered that. The limited point is, yes, it should be done. Am I going to do it? Probably not, because I don't have the time. So the likes of you should be doing it. Yes. So my question is that Purana has uh, we call it like as mythology. Purana is like mythology. So why it is called mythology? And the second question is that there is an attempt in Purana to understand truth and to know truth through is Can you hold the mic closer? I, I heard the first question. I can't hear the second question. The second question, question is that in Puranas there is an attempt to no truth through stories. Through stories. So I just wanted to know that how truth is there in the stories. Is stories are real or just the stories are created to help people understand the truth? I did not call the Puranas myths. I do not think the Puranas are myths. They are also itihasa. Itihasa is itihasa. This is indeed what happened. This is history. People who call the Puranas myths, and there are some people, some who write books, they have never read the Puranas. They believe in dumbed down versions of the Puranas, such as we used to watch on television, probably still do, and watch on YouTube, and we will watch Adi Purush and decide that that is what the Valmiki Ramayana says. I am not concerned with those people. Each Purana has to satisfy five characteristics, Pancha Lakshana. These five characteristics are Sarga, the original creation, and the subsequent eventual dissolution. The secondary cycle of creation and dissolution, Pratisarga. The origins of Devas and Rishis, their lineages. The cycles, the Manvantaras presided over by a Manu. And the genealogies of the king, Surya Vamsha and Chandra Vamsha. There is only one Purana which sticks only to these five bare essentials, that is the Vishnu Purana. All the other Puranas expand on these five themes and are encyclopedias. If someone tells you a Purana is a myth, 
प्लीज आस्क हिम डज ही डू अ श्राद्ध सेरेमनी इफ ही डज अ श्राद्ध सेरेमनी इफ द पुराणस आर अ मिथ व्हाई डज ही डू अ श्राद्ध सेरेमनी व्हेन ही गोस टू अ टेंपल व्हाई डज ही डू अ प्रदक्षिण all of these are in the puranas the way we construct an image is on the basis of descriptions in the agni purana the way we construct a temple is based on the descriptions and norms given in the matsya purana if all of these are myths then why do we observe them in our daily practices <coughs> we observe them in our daily practices because the puranas represent the practice of dharma the upanishads were composed by people who had retired on vanaprastha and sanyasa what percentage of the population goes off on vanaprastha and sanyasa less than 5% even lower perhaps 2% what does the rest of the population do the rest of the population as grihasthas are engaged <coughs> today and 5000 years ago in earning subsistence hopefully following dharma and thinking about what is dharma in this life and in the next life that that is the reason the puranas are described as pancham veda now if the puranas are myth i would have to believe that you are a myth <laughs> what you do every day is a myth that i am not prepared to believe don't take it personally but the younger generation is very impatient <laughs> does not have the time give me the gist of the puranas in 140 characters <laughs> krishna veda vyas dai pan compose the puranas full stop you need not know anything more if you have the inclination and if you have the patience then you should read the original texts you should not read what a b c and d has said as a student you should never accept what the teacher has said even if they are excellent teachers from the book <laughs> the task of every student is to question परिप्रश्न सो यू नीड टू रीड क्वेश्चन इज स्टार्ट विथ वॉट दैट रियली डिपेंड्स ऑन योर इनक्लिनेशन मोस्ट पीपल हैव अ फ्लीटिंग डिग्री ऑफ फेमिलियरिटी विथ द रामायण एंड द महाभारत मोस्ट पीपल डू नॉट हैव 
a fleeting degree of familiarity with the Puranas, except for very dumb down, dummy for Puranas kind of thing. I would say Valmiki Ramayana is a good text to start with. It is shorter, it's beautiful. Mahabharata, I would say, do not venture into it unless you are really keen, because I said 10 volumes, 2.25 million words. <laughs> so far as the Puranas are concerned, at some point you will feel the internal compulsion after having read the <coughs> dummy versions to read the original. Until you have that internal compulsion, I don't think you should venture, because these are unabridged texts, they are not meant for you. So I meet a lot of people, again don't take it personally, from the younger generation. I am going to read one shloka of the Bhagavad Gita every day. For God's sake, why? <laughs> is it a fetish? <laughs> the Bhagavad Gita is not an easy text. So why read one shloka of the Bhagavad Gita every day? Read it only when the internal urge comes. I will also like to respond to this on a slightly different note from you, Dr. Devrai. Your question is not just your question, it's a question of your generation. They find themselves dissociated with the social mores of the past and do not relate to these epics. So what do you learn from them and if you want to, what is the best way? not a wrong approach or not a wrong thought. Just as we are doing this for the Shravan tradition, we meant for the young people. It's layered. You can see it in brief as a snapshot. You can read about it. And there is a computer there. You go to the screen and you go as deep as you want. There are thousands and thousands of pages of text. So you are to choose what you want to study. That enablement requires to be done. Possibly, if my colleagues in Bhattarkar Institute agree, we can take this up for the Puranas, provided Dr. Dev Rai agrees to guide us. We will create a similar system. Last question, please. Two hands here. Yeah. This is Talena. The Prime Minister in his 15th August speech uh, talked about Panchakran and the second of which is the which is about decolonization or getting rid of the colonial mindset. My question is, is there a connection or do the epics have a role to play in helping us in decolonizing a person? It's not really relevant to the talk that I delivered. <coughs> Epics, yes, from the very usage of the word epics. If I'm using the word epic, I have automatically at the back of my mind Homer and Virgil. Why should I even use the word epic? Let me instead use the word itihasa or itihasa Purana. Unfortunately, as I have been saying, Itihasa and Purana represent the core of our practices. As representative of the younger generation, the lady who asked this question, will mechanically chant the Gayatri Mantra because it is fashionable to do so. And at the end of it, we'll say, Om Shanti Hi Shanti Hi Shanti Hi. The younger generation will never ask, why Shanti three times? Why not 18 times? Why not 21 times? The younger generation has been even more influenced 
by the Western influence. And so far as Itihas Purana is concerned, I think our generation and the generation which preceded us were gifted. When was the first translation of any Purana done? Horace Wilson, 1867, I think, Vishnu Purana. At that time, Haraprasad Shastri went to Nepal, collected texts from the Royal Library and the Asiatic Society brought out. editions in Sanskrit of the Puranas. Who has translated the Puranas? Other than Wilson, Parjitar, before me, Parmatanatta. Isn't it our job to translate all these? So it is not that the Westerners have, Westerners have colonized our minds, we ourselves have colonized our minds. So I quite agree with what you are saying, but that is a broader discourse. Thank you, sir. Uh, would you like to conclude? Please, sir. Yes, go ahead. That's the last one. <laughs> Sir, I have uh, two questions. First question is, uh, Puranas are, are said to be uh, sort of infected or infested with some added, uh, some, 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 some things or some uh, some more uh, stories or some uh, more content was added later on from the pristine version of Puranas. It is said that they are they have evolved over time. So how do we differentiate between the earlier versions of Purana and the current versions of Purana? And the second question is earlier, in earlier times or ancient times, Puranas were interwoven uh, with the social system, the governance system in a very uh, synchronized or a beautiful manner. So the so all the ethics or do's or don'ts which are there in Puranas were were a part of the society. But currently we see that we are disconnected from what is uh, told in the Puranas, and the and it, it's it's uh, and we have more of a Western versions of governance, codes of conduct, and ethics. So how do we uh, re invigorate our society with what is said? How do we align the current society, take, uh, take the beautiful things that are there and re-import All right. First question, I'm not I sure. Know. I have heard about it, but I'm not sure whether. First question is obviously the Puranas were composed over a period of time. Obviously, all the Puranas were not composed at the same time. Some Puranas were earlier, some Puranas were later. We are probably talking about a range of something like 300 CE to about 1100 CE. Is it possible to segregate the earlier portions from the later portions. You can never do it, certainly. You can do it in a stochastic or probabilistic sense. You will never be able to give a certain answer. For example, if I read the Bhagavad Gita, There are places where the word ma, as in don't or no, is used. In later Sans Sanskrit, the ma would not be used, the na would be used. 
exactly similarly from the language you can sometimes determine what is later and what is earlier um, most of these shlokas were in anushtup there are sections where the anushtup breaks down so you can quite clearly see that this was a subsequent author let me ask you a question and don't respond in a hurry don't respond in a hurry i am going to slide a slope shloka and i'm going to ask you where is it from यदा यदा हि धर्मस्य ग्लानेर भवति परंतप अव्यथानं धर्मस्य तदात्मानं सृजाम्महं वेर इज दिस फ्रॉम डोंट रिस्पोंड इन आरी नॉट इन द गीता आई एम आस्किंग हर यदा यदा हि धर्मस्य ग्लानेर भवति परंतप इट्स फ्रॉम महाभारत इट इज एल्सवेयर इन द महाभारत द गीता इज ग्लानेर भवति भारत द मोमेंट इट इज परंतपद अनुष्टुप छंद हैज ब्रोकन डाउन सो इट कुड नॉट हैव बीन वेद व्यास समवन एल्स फॉर द महाभारत समवन नेम्ड एम आर यार्ती मेनी इयर्स अगो सैट डाउन एंड डिड अ स्टैटिस्टिकल एनालिसिस to identify different authors of the mahabharat <coughs> it was published by the bhandarkar oriental research institute i think in 1981 and he identified five different authors similarly you can do a similar exercise for the puranas question is for what purpose apart from writing an academic paper and answering your intellectual curiosity for what purpose because you will never be able to establish with any certainty you have a range and the fact of the matter is sri arvindo said in his essays on the gita how does it matter whether it was 300 ce whether it was 500 ce how does it matter it represents our dharma full stop now so far as the second part of the question is remind me about the second part of the question you don't have to repeat all of it just tell me what it was about puran uh, has a lot of ethical and governance uh, oh yes yeah okay. but they are uh, we consider them as past wait, wait, wait. how can wait wait, wait. <laughs> let me use my hat of an economist and say there are two polar opposites in terms of economic models in the world as they exist both of these are polar opposites and neither of which exists perfectly in the world one extreme is the capitalist model where every decision is taken by the market at the other extreme is the socialist model where every decision is taken by the state extreme caricatures extreme models neither of which existed in our texts we had a third model where some decisions were taken by the state a limited set of decisions were taken by the state a limited set of decisions were taken by the individual or the community and the rest of the decisions were taken by the by the individual and the rest of the decisions were taken by the community so this is the third model this is what dean dal upadhyay spoke about in his uh, series of lectures in april 1965 now you will say all this is in the past the british produced gazetteers 
initially for the country and then for districts. I think it was Ambala or Rotak. Ambala District Gazette of 1883. What is happening in 1883? In 1883, a canal is being built in Ambala. It may be Rotak also, I may have got confused. How much is that canal going to cost in 1883? Rupees 45,000. I have rounded off. 45,000 rupees. Who paid? The government paid 20,000. 25,000 was paid by the community. This is not thousands of years ago. Just over 100 years ago. Today we expect the government to do everything. And we have abdicated our responsibility as community. Who ensured that there weren't unfair trade practices and restrictive business practices? There was no competition commission. The Sainis or the guilds did it. Who ensured skill development? No national skill development corporation. The Sainis did it. Who ensured MRP? The Sainis did it. Who did public works? You and I did that as part of Ishti, uh, Ishta and Purti. So what has been lost? is our awareness of these traditions and I'm not talking about thousands of years ago, even 100 years ago. Look at the way we maintained as a community our waterworks. We don't know, we don't care, even though these are a citizen's responsibilities under the Constitution. So the problem is lack of knowledge and lack of interest. Madam uh, Talera, 1883 Gazetteer is in our library. Please come and have a look. But uh, I'm not sure whether it was Ambala or Rotak. And uh, you know, if you were wondering, the economist came up with something. Towards the end, he started the debate on freebie versus ravedi, <laughs> when he said that the community should also pay and the government should not do everything. Well, uh, Vikram, we didn't discuss what's going to be the rupee dollar rate next week or next month or. Uh, I think we had a great feast. I have to mention a few things before I propose my vote of thanks. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, uh, Dr. Firodia, I know that you said that perhaps you didn't read the title exactly clearly because every, uh, every article, it says journey into the epics. So uh, it was deliberately meant to be his journey. And if you uh, wanted to have more economic principles, we'll have to invite him again. And uh, Vivek, please come again. Uh, but you, in your talk, in your remarks, did mention the foundational principles of uh, Rishabh Dev, which is the foundation of Jainism, uh, which was uh, Asi, Masi, Kasi, Vanijya, Vidya, and Kala. Vanijya means commerce or economic trade. Uh, I think uh, Kasi means communication, right? And uh, weapons. So all these, uh, you know, so there is a connection. And in fact, if you heard uh, Dr. Devroy, he did talk about uh, at least three or four times in his talk, you know, the publisher, I went here and there, and ultimately it did matter ki market hai ki nahi. So even the great epics have to answer to the economic reality of the times. So, and uh, he reminded us that Indologists didn't do it, perhaps Sanskrit scholars, they had to wait for an economist to come and write those uh, five million words. So, uh, you know, uh, don't, don't think that uh, economics uh, profession is not contributing in so many different ways. And incidentally, since it came up again and again, uh, the rat or the mouse is the Vahana vehicle of Lord Ganesh, who is the god of wisdom and learning. So please don't, you know, if, if it's okay to be in the rat race, don't be misguided by Dr. Devroy. <laughs> the Mooshaka. You know, uh, everybody has to be in some race. So, right to Vahan and Lord Ganeshka. So, it's okay. Uh, and about, he kept on saying, this is, some gentleman asked, is it a myth? And he somehow, you know, I heard him two, three times, and even between the lines, 
मिथ्या मिथ दिस इज नॉट मिथ इट इज इतिहास इट हॅपन असं झालं बट दिस इज दॅज इंडियन दिस इज अवर फेवरेट बॅटल ग्राउंड हिस्ट्री तो हमको दिस हॅपन ऑर नॉट हॅपन आय एम रिमाइंडेड ऑफ अ मूवी नाईन्टीन फिफ्टी देर वॉज अ क्लासिक मूवी मेड द नेम ऑफ द मूवी इज कॉल्ड राशोमोन बाय अ डिरेक्टर कॉल अकिरा कुरोसावा यंगस्टर्स नो हॅव यू हर्ड ऑफ दिस मूवी ये ये हो के पीछे सो रॉशोमन सर इट इज नाईन्टीन फिफ्टी मूवी विच इज अबाउट एन इन्सिडेंट विच हॅपन्स दिस अन अनफॉर्च्युनेट मर्डर ऑफ अ मॅन अँड इज वाईफ इज रेप्ड अँड देर आर फोर डिफरंट आय विटनेसेस ऑफ दॅट इन्सिडेंट कुरोसोवा बाय द वे इज अ व्हेरी यू नो वन ऑफ द क्लासिक डिरेक्टर्स ऑफ मॉडर्न टाइम्स बट द मूवी जस्ट टेल्स यू दॅट दिस हॅपन देर आर फोर आय विटनेसेस अँड all four eye witnesses are completely different completely different so it happened ye jo bole na itihas but even i mean that's a great great movie because it shows that what happened in front of your very eyes in the next fleeting instant we don't know whether it happened or not or the version of people who are describing it who are eye witnesses or people who are writing about it or people who are reporting it or people many many thousands of years translating it so we should just let it be i don't want to provoke another long discussion uh, at today but we'll be happy to do it over a uh, lunch but so this myth versus itihasa parath we should let, let it be for the time being uh, these are great this is great uh, literature if not you know if you he doesn't like the word epics uh, because epics uh, then you think about uh, homer's odyssey or something but you call it whatever you know epics kahiye great literature kahiye Uh, but this is a, it's such a fertile thing i think there is one uh, uh, devra there is one thing which is said about mahabharata right that anything that ever needs to be ever written any story is already in the mahabharata so that's the khyati of for this great literature so anything you know that lady asked you where should we start i think i think it's okay to begin anywhere just you know it's, it's a glimpse of a very vast canvas so uh, it's my privilege and delight to uh, propose a vote of thanks uh, i would of course like like to thank the uh, the main chief guest uh, whose public lecture we heard uh, vivek devroy i would like to propose a special thanks to our chair who, uh, uh, who agreed to chair today's session uh, dr abhay firodia i also want to acknowledge the presence of some of uh, the dignitaries who are here the commandant of the army uh, sports training institute Uh, vice chancellor uh, pandey of uh, uh, lekan college uh, mr uh, pradeep rawat former member of parliament from pune uh, mr dilip karmarkar who is the former vice chancellor of pune university uh, professor medha uh, scholar and uh, professor from indian institute of uh, sorry indian uh, institute of advanced studies in shimla i'm sorry if i'm missing some people uh, mr talera mr and mrs talera Uh, sorry if i can't count everyone but uh, of course my colleagues from the faculty uh, the students from gokhale institute and many uh, of our guests so come on the invitations of uh, bori bandar ke institute and pune international center and gokhale institute uh, so uh, thanks also to my colleagues from administration and uh, under our registrar for for uh, making this uh, arrangements and uh, this event a success and of course a special thanks to all of you for coming in such large numbers on a saturday morning uh, but i'm sure you'll agree that we've had a feast uh, of a, of a session and uh, we really kept this tradition of scholarship and and de- debate and discussion alive so special thanks to the speaker and all of you please give them a warm applause and thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you